Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Amateur Radio Technician class. We were just wait about one minute. Hello, I got everyone. a couple of and messages of persons. The Amateur Radio. Sorry about the echo. A couple of persons who have indicated that uh, they will be just joining in a minute or so. Okay, so I'm seeing the persons who have indicated that they will join um, online. So again, good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, this evening's Amateur Radio Technician class. Uh, we have an agenda which will hopefully take us uh, no more than an hour this evening. We will have a brief discussion on the Amateur Radio course itself, what the learning objectives are. Uh, how the sessions are going to be held going forward, as well as uh, the material that has been distributed via email and uh, the exams as well. And we will also get into some of the topics today. So essentially, uh, we are doing an orientation as the first session. So welcome everyone. Certainly, Thank you for your interest in pursuing the amateur radio course. Hopefully this will lead to you becoming a licensed amateur radio operator. Training is extremely important to react and amateur radio is one more tool in the toolkit. These sessions are being held virtually uh, using the webinar type format. I do apologize in advance for any interruptions during the presentations, as well as any challenges that we may encounter. Uh, due to work issues, I may have to pause and attend to work matter. So if that occurs, I do apologize. We are also recording these sessions uh, for future playback. So please be aware of that. And there are really no prerequisites to the course other than um, English and a little bit of maths. Uh, the key is really your interest in pursuing the course. Uh, if you do have questions, and we will make some room for some Q&A, we ask that you use the chat box feature. So I am monitoring. Um, I've seen a couple of, mess couple of messages already. So I trust that persons are already familiar with the use of Zoom. Uh, so, I'm here just as a guide, and it is up to each of us as participants to do the work. But most, most importantly, please have some fun, right? Hopefully we'll make what might otherwise be some dry material a little bit interesting and fun. So just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Ravindranath Goswami, most people know me as Robbie. Uh, that's my email address on the screen. Uh, my cell phone contact, should you need to reach me via WhatsApp. I'm a member of REACT, uh, TITARS, that's the Trinidad and Tobago Amateur Radio Society. The ARRL, that's the Amateur Radio Relay League. RSGB, which is the Radio Society of Great Britain. And AMSAT, which is the Amateur Satellite Corporation. Uh, my call signs, amateur call signs, are 9Z4RG, phonetically spelled 9 Zulu 4 Romeo Gulf. Uh, that's my Trinidad and Tobago call sign. I also hold a US call, Alpha Kilo 4 November Bravo, or AK4NB. And I am an authorized ARRL instructor. So react for those of us who may not be aware, and we do have participants who are not react members at this time. So just to indicate uh, who and what is react, react is really an acronym for radio emergency associated communications teams. And of course the mission of uh, react is to provide public safety communications, uh, assistance whenever and wherever needed 
And we have a trained cadre of volunteers that are citizens. And we utilize any and every uh, available means of communications possible that's legal. And the motto for the organization is public service through communications. So just a quick structure of the organization, REACT International Incorporated is the parent body headquartered in Glendale, California. And REACT was founded in 1962 in the US. REACT International has a board of directors and there are also uh, nine regions that comprises of REACT International of which Trinidad and Tobago is part of region nine. Essentially there are eight regions that are within the United States and region nine is essentially what we call the rest of the world. Uh, there's an optional structure in REACT known as councils that teams belong to. Uh, teams, however, are really the key uh, component of REACT. Tr uh, REACT in Trinidad and Tobago was founded in 1964. So we are celebrating 56 years in Trinidad and Tobago and internationally we are celebrating 58 years this year. And of course we have members who are adult members and we also have the youth membership also called or known as affectionately junior year. So about the course that we are embarking on today, and I really hope everyone stays the course or can participate in all of the sessions. Uh, what are we about here today, amateur radio? So the definition of amateur radio is given on your screen and that's taken directly from the ARRL website. Uh, it's a hobby. Right? Some people say it's not a hobby because it's serious, but uh, it's defined as a hobby, a service, and it involves people, processes, and technologies. So you have electronics and communications. And of course, ham radio operators communicate with each other across the globe within uh, townships. And this can be done without the traditional communications infrastructure such as telephones, landlines, cell phones, internet, and so on. And there are three classes of licenses in the program that we are using. Uh, that's the ARL uh, system, technician, general, and extra. Those are issued by the FCC in the United States. So, learning objectives for this course. Well, we are looking at three specific areas, which will be forked into sub areas. Basic regulations. That's one of the main reasons why there's an exam for amateur radio. We need to be aware of what are the regulations governing the use of radio spectrum in particular. Our operating practices, how do we utilize the technology and the technology itself, a bit of the electrical and electronics theory. Earlier, it was mentioned that there are three licensed classes in the FCC system, technician, general, and extra. But we are here concerned with the technician class, also known as element two, because that's the name of the exam. Just to let you know, there's a question pool associated with each class and you should have already received your question pool via email. For the technician class, there are 400, approximately 400 questions in the question pool, of which when you do the exam, and I hope each and every one will consider taking the exam, you will get 35 questions. Uh, if you pass the, if I should say, when you pass the technician or element two exam, you will be issued a call sign in the US. And in Trinidad and Tobago, it makes you eligible for a basic class of license to, towards a 9Z3 call sign or 9Z3 call sign, right? The rest of information is just uh, to show that the technician is one step in the amateur radio licensing process. There's also the general and the extra. So our sessions today is really introductory, an introductory uh, session. We expect to have about 10 other sessions 
followed by a, re a review session. We expect to meet one day per week. As it is right now, that day will be Fridays at 8.30 p.m. However, I'm very interested in obtaining feedback from the participants as to what day and time works best. Each session could be about one hour duration, but I'm hoping no more than one hour. And we will take a couple of five minute breaks in between. And just to let you know, we, the sessions are exam focused. So all of the effort towards uh, making progress in the course would be towards you preparing you for the exam. So that's what we mean by exam focus. It's not just a theory course where we come and uh, rattle out a lot of theory. We will be talking a bit of theory, but with an exam focus. So persons who are interested, if you attain at least a 75% attendance of these sessions, a certificate of participation will be issued. So each person should have received material via email. Four documents should have been attached to the email with the Zoom webinar link. Uh, a syllabus, a study guide, a question pool, and an FCC document that's known as part 95, sorry, part 97, which is the amateur radio portion of those regulations in the US. Note there are many, many, did I say many? Online resources that you can access. Optionally, you can purchase online any of the recommended texts for studying for the amateur radio exam. We have a couple of photos of a couple, uh, those books, the study guides, both from the ARRL as well as WB6NOA, publishes really good material. So if you want to get a hard copy book in hand, uh, you can, and it is highly recommended because some of these texts go into much deeper uh, the amateur radio uh, hobby itself, what's involved, as well as uh, deeper explanations on the theory. So I highly recommend that at some point uh, consider, each participant consider obtaining those, uh, some of those uh, textbooks. However, the information that has been emailed to you is sufficient for you to study and pass the exams. So you do not have to invest in any additional material. However, again, I emphasize highly recommended that you get some of those textbooks. So the exams themselves, certainly doable. There are no unseen questions. All of the questions that you get on the exam are from the question pool that you already have via email. The exam sessions are scheduled by what is known as VEs or volunteer examiners. And in Trinidad and Tobago, we do have a committed group of volunteer examiners and exams prior to COVID-19 were scheduled on average four times per year. We are looking at the technician class or what is known as the element two exam. It is a multiple choice exam. However, note that the order of the answers, A, B, C, D, changes. Uh, so if you study the question pool and for a particular question, the answer was A. In the exam, that answer could easily shift down to C, so they randomize it. Uh, so there are people who try to learn whether A is correct, B is correct, C or D. Well, that doesn't help in this exam because when you get the exam, the order would have changed from the order listed in the question pool. So we do not recommend at all trying to memorize A, B, C, D for any question. Beware of distractors uh, where you will see close answers. So uh, don't be tricked. Certainly study for the exam. Don't take it for granted. 
sometimes you would think it's multiple choice. All the questions are known. Therefore, I don't have to study. I'll just go and take the exam. Strongly suggest, please, each person study the material. You will, as mentioned earlier, get 35 questions on the exam. And you must attain a pass mark of 75%, which is 26 questions. So you must get at least 26 right of the 35 questions. Uh, to do the exams, the fee that you will pay to the volunteer examiner will be $100, and that is really to cover the costs and expenses associated with uh, conducting those exams. The interesting thing about it is that $100 payment to the volunteer examiners will allow you to actually do all three levels if you so wish. You can do the technician and the other levels that we were mentioned earlier, the general and extra, you can attempt them uh, as well for that same one fee. So just bear that in mind because many persons actually study both the technician and general and attempt both of them one time. There are a few people who actually study all three, technician, general, and extra, and attempt all three. So that is uh, certainly possible. You will need a pencil to shade in for the in-person exams. A calculator, a basic calculator with simple scientific uh, logs, for, ex for example, would be recommended. And here's the point, the last point, very important. Use the online practice exams that we will be providing links to. The text that were circulated to you has links to online practice exams. If you do the online practice, practice exams, you will know whether you're ready for the real exam. It will allow you to develop confidence in yourself and it will tell you uh, whether you're likely to pass the real exam. If you do three or four or five practice exams online in, in a row and you have passed all of them handsomely, very well, then you can say, hey, I'm ready for the exam. If you're taking the exams, you're passing one, almost making one, missing another one, making one and so on, then that might suggest that you could do a little more work. However, even if you, uh, in that status where you, you might be passing some, not some, and an exam comes up, the volunteer examiners schedule the exam, still consider taking the exam, right? Um, you may very well be ready for it, uh, better than you think. <laughs> so here are the links to the exams. These are all in the study material that you have. So I know some people in webinars, you like to screenshot, write down and so on. So I'll leave it up for a couple of seconds if you want to write down the first one or two. However, all of this is in your uh, email package, right? These links will take you to a website or websites that will allow you to run a practice exam. It will generate 35 questions for you and you answer them. And at the end, it will tell you whether you passed as well as which ones might have been incorrect. So you could then focus in on those questions that you might have gotten incorrect. So I would like feedback via email uh, possibly. Uh, so if you have any preferences, if Friday nights at 8.30 is not a convenient time to you, please so indicate when would be a better day and time for you to attend these sessions. All right, so let us dive straight in to the material. So just permit me a minute to pull up the additional information. Right. So here we have it. Uh, okay.
All right, so in your package, you should have received this syllabus document. I think it's an excellent document. It's, it's uh, been prepared by a gentleman, Jack uh, Tiley and his uh, friends. Um, they have made it available free of charge. So it's available to you as a study guide as well. The book that we'll be using for our course because it's compressed it allows us to focus in on the key essentials of the amateur radio course. And we will be dealing with most of the majority of the question pool. So this is the book we'll be using. And instead of using slides, I will simply use this book so that you can follow along uh, if you wish. Some people I know told me earlier today that they printed the book. That's fine as well. So I will use the book so that it will be easier to follow rather than uh, using the slides. We also have the question pool itself. It's a very textual document, but it has all of the questions that you will encounter as well as the answers. So this is just for your reference. Uh, the good thing about it is it has the correct answer and has all the distractors as well, all of the wrong answers. Uh, so at least you could see what the wrong, wrong answers, how they are structured and, and so on. Well, this document might be a little bit hard to read on the screen, but that's the part 97 amateur radio service document that we talked about earlier. So it's what the amateur radio examination in the US is based on. It's there for your reference. However, for the course, we will be using this book, the No Nonsense Technician Class License Study Guide. And this gentleman has kindly made this available to us at no cost. You can purchase this document on Amazon if you wish. Uh, it's also available on his website. So, but there's no need to purchase it if it is that you're comfortable with reading the material on a computer, phone, or tablet, or device. So just to make one more point before we get into some of the material, the question pools themselves have an expiration date. So for the technician class, the current question pool is valid from July 2018 to June 2022. So please note that when you're studying the question pool or if you're buying books online, make sure that you purchase the current question pool because each time they revise every five years or so, they will change a percentage of the questions. Many of them continue onwards, but they do change them up. So if you have the opportunity to purchase a book or get a text, try to get the latest version of the text, please. All right. So at this time, I will just take a two minute break. So persons, if you want to take a two minute break, you can do so as well. We'll be back at, uh, it's now 8.55 at 
Okay, so we'll be restarting in one minute's time, one minute to restart. Okay, so again, let's continue. So we are going to get into a bit of the material so that we can get an idea of what's involved in the following sessions. As mentioned before, we are going to be exam focused, which will involve a little bit of theory and then looking at what questions are, asked, are going to be asked in the exams. We will not be dealing with distractors during the course. The main reason is that it will take a lot more time for us to deal with distractors. So on your own, I did mention that each one of us will have to put some time and effort into it. You can read the distractors. It's there in the question pool. So we'll be focusing on, we'll be focusing on what the answer to the questions are and why they are the answers, right? So the text, the no nonsense guide, we are on page four. If you are on a PDF, it will be page nine. And we are looking at our first bit of theory. So many persons might already be familiar. So not every one of us would be. So let's, uh, let's go through a bit of theory uh, in respect of electrical principles. So the question is that we ask is what is a circuit? On your screen, there's a diagram in front of you that represents a simple electric circuit. If we were to look at the diagram, we will see that there is a symbol for a battery. we will see that there's a symbol for a resistor. Those are two symbols of components that are connected to each other with a wire or some form of link. So if we were to follow the circuit, we will see that the battery is connected to the resistor and the resistor comes all the way back around and is connected to the battery. That is considered a circuit or an electric circuit. Because when it's connected in this way, the battery itself has a potential to allow the flow of current through the circuit. It will go through the resistor and make its way back to the battery. When I discuss electric, trick and electronic theory, I usually like to think of water because we'll be dealing with some principles that I think using water as the analogy can help us understand the theory a little easier. So what are those elements that we're talking about? The first one is called voltage also called an electromotive force. So we might have heard, you know, there's a voltage. What's the voltage? Uh, TNTX supply is a 110 voltage, you know. But the term that we will be using is EMF or electromotive force. And if we think of water, that is almost like the water pressure. So the higher the pressure, the higher the voltage. 
So it's just an analogy and an example. The other element that we talk about is current. So commonly we'll say, you know, current gone. Let's say there's an outage in our area, we say current gone. Well, current itself is the actual flow of the electrons in a circuit. You can think of current as the amount of water that is flowing in a pipe. So if you have a pipe that's coming into your house from Wasser, that's probably a three quarter inch pipe. It will have a pressure and a certain amount of flow. So the pressure is like the voltage and the flow is like the current. So if you had a bigger pipe, let's say you had a four inch pipe, the amount of water that will flow in a four inch pipe will certainly be more than a three quarter inch pipe. So it's the same thing with electric current. If you have a small wire, you may have a small current flow. If you have a bigger wire, you can have a larger current flow. And what flows in an electric circuit would be the electrons. Just like in a water circuit from Wasser, what flows is water. In the case of an electric circuit, the thing that is flowing is called an electron or electrons. So that is what is flowing. But think of electrons like water. They flow. When they flow, they also encounter something that's called resistance. So if you think about it, in your home water system, you have taps, you have a lock off valve, a shut off valve, uh, you have small pipes, big pipes. So in your water system, when you go from a big pipe to a small pipe size, there's some resistance in that. When you lock off the valve or shut it off halfway, you're introducing resistance to the flow of water. Well, in the same way in an electronic circuit, you have resistance. And resistance is what impedes the flow of the electrons. So those are the terms that we need to be familiar with in respect of an electric, uh, electric circuit. The electromotive force, also called voltage, the current, which is the flow of the electrons in the circuit. In other words, if the circuit is open, there is no flow. And the resistance, which is what restricts the flow of those electrons. So those are the comp basic components of an electronic circuit. They have symbols as well associated with those components and their properties. So the Electromotive force, of which the symbol is E. Sometimes you might see V. But electromotive force, symbol E, the unit of electromotive force is called uh, volts or the volt. The unit of current is the ampere. And the symbol is I. The unit of resistance, the unit is ohms, and the symbol is R. So let's go to the questions that's asked about these terms that we were just introduced to. So the first question, what is the electrical term for electromotive force that causes electron flow? So that electromotive force, voltage. Another way of putting the question is, what is the unit of electromotive force? And the answer is the volt. It should be capitalized, by the way. Another question in the question pool how much voltage does a mobile transceiver require? So we know the answer will be something volts because we're talking about voltage. So the answer has to be in volts. 
to answer this question, the question is a mobile transceiver. So a mobile transceiver is a mobile radio. If you think about your car stereo in your car, what voltage does it require? We may or may not be aware that our car battery is nominally 12 volts. So the simple answer to the question, how much voltage does a mobile transceiver require? The answer is 12 volts. So if you see a distractor, say 24 volts, 110 volts, 220 volts, or whatever the distractors might be, those will be incorrect because a mobile device uses the available voltage in a car, which is 12 volts. So we come to current now. So we discussed a bit about current and what current is. We did say current is the actual flow of the electrons. And when we were talking about water, we are saying uh, that flow is water in the case of um, when we're talking about water circuits, it's water that's flowing. In the case of an electric circuit, what you have flowing are called electrons. The symbol that is used for current is I. And the unit of measurement of current is the ampere. So let's look at some of the questions in the question pool that deals with current. Fairly straightforward question. What is the name of the flow of electrons in an electron, electronic, uh, sorry, electric circuit? The flow of electrons is the current. In other words, what is the flow of water in a pipe? Well, uh, I don't think we talk about current in a pipe, but if we go into the beach, we'll talk about the flow of the seawater as the current. Huh? So you can make an analogy there. The flow of the electrons is called the current. Another question that could be asked very similarly, Electric current is measured in which of the following units? So we just need to be aware that the ampere is the unit of current. So if we are measuring current, we will say it's one ampere, two amperes, 0.5 or half of an amp, three amperes, 10 amperes. And I said amp just now because Oftentimes, you will hear persons abbreviating the word ampere and simply say amp, A-M-P. So we talked about your car battery. The car battery, uh, battery in a vehicle, uses direct current, meaning that the current will only flow in one direction. The question in the question pool to deal with that concept goes like this. What is the name of a current that flows in one direction only? The answer is direct current, also abbreviated as DC. So you might have heard that your battery or a power supply is a 12 volt DC power supply. Uh, if we have persons in the audience that have power supplies for your radios, you might be asking the question, but you know, you talked about 12 volts, but I see my power supply saying it's 13.8 volts. Yes, yeah, so that is true. So you may encounter power supplies that's 13.8 volts, but for the purpose of our exams, notice the question earlier, how much voltage does a mobile transceiver typically require? The answer is 12 volts. Okay. So I hope we're doing well so far at introducing some of the theory and going directly to the questions that relate to the theory. Okay. So we mentioned the concept of resistance. That is 
the property of material to oppose the flow of electrons. When we were talking about water, remember we talked about in a water pipe, you can have things that uh, maybe the water pipe is getting clogged or it's building up uh, something on the inside and there's resistance to the water flow of water. Well, the same thing with electric circuits. There can be resistance that opposes the flow of those electrons in the circuit. The symbol, we use the letter R to represent resistance, but the measurement of resistance or the unit of resistance is called the ohm, OHM. If you write the symbol for ohm, it uses the Greek, le the Greek letter omega. So earlier we discussed that a battery gives you 12 volts DC, direct current. The TNTech supply or the supply that we get from our electricity provider is not DC, but AC or alternating current. With alternating current, the voltage or the current changes direction as opposed to a DC current where it's in one direction. So let's deal with the question in the pool that asks about that concept. The question is, what is the name of a current that reverses directions on a regular basis? Well, you already know it's not direct current because direct current goes in one direction only. So if, the, if one of the distractors is direct current, you know that's wrong. The correct answer would be alternating current because the alternating current reverses directions on a regular basis. And if you think about it, the words allude to that alternating current, one to the other, one to the other. There's another concept that's important when we are talking about electronics and electrical properties and radio. And that is the concept of frequency. So persons in the, on the webinar who are radio operators might have already heard, well, what frequency are you on? <laughs> All right, so we may be already familiar with the, the term frequency, but what exactly is frequency? And how does it apply to the theory that we're talking about? Well, remember earlier we talked about the alternating current switching directions. The frequency is simply how often does that switch occur? So one way to think about it is if you're riding a bicycle, and you are going around a roundabout. So you're riding a bicycle and you're going around a roundabout. So you make one turn, a second turn, a third turn. The rate at which you ride the bicycle around the roundabout is your frequency. How many cycles per second? So in electrical, in, in electricity, we talk about uh, voltage of supply and we will say that the voltage is 110 volts or 120 volts, but we may also hear that the electrical supply is 60 Hertz. So if you were to look at the TNTEC specification for the electrical supply that they provide to your home, you may see something like 115 slash 230, which is the voltage and they will tell you 60 hertz. So there are typically two frequencies in use around the world, 60 hertz and 50 hertz. But 60 hertz is what we use in Trinidad and Tobago. So let's look at the question associated in the question pool. What term describes the number of times per second that an alternating current makes a complete cycle? The answer is frequency. So how many times does it switch? How many times does it alternate? That is the frequency. So if it alternated twice per second, then the answer would be two. But two what, right? <laughs> two cycles. But we know that a cycle is measured 
in Hertz, H-E-R-T-Z. So when we are talking about frequency, the base unit is called the Hertz. The note here is that one Hertz is one cycle per second. So if you're riding your bicycle around the roundabout and you rode once around the roundabout in one second, then your, your frequency is one Hertz. If you are really good and you can ride around the roundabout twice in a second, then your frequency is two Hertz. So the same thing happens with current. As the current switches directions, how many times it switches will be the frequency. Again, in Trinidad and Tobago and quite a bit of the world, that frequency is 60 Hertz. And it's mentioned here that the frequency of the alternating current available from a wall socket is 60 Hertz. So we are aiming to stop at 9.30. It's now 20 past nine, and we are going through the material, looking at some of the theory and the associated questions in the question pool. So not only are we touching a little bit on the theory, but we are looking directly at the questions that you're going to get in the exams. So moving right along. A conductor is something or a material that will conduct electricity. So a conductor is either a good conductor or a bad conductor. So it either conducts electricity well or not so much. Copper is a good conductor. That's why the electrical wires in your house most likely will be copper wire. I say most likely because some of the older wiring from back in the day would have been aluminum wiring inside of your house. But copper is used today for your electrical wiring because it is a good conductor. So let's look at the question associated with that bit of theory. Which of the following is a good electrical conductor? Now we don't, we notice we're not dealing with the distractors. So they may have other options in your multiple choice, but the answer to what is a good electrical conductor is copper. And the note here for you that silver is a better conductor than copper. So you're probably wondering if silver is a better conductor than copper, why do we not use silver for our electrical installations, our wiring? Why our extension cores are not made from silver? Well, main reason is cost. Copper is a lot less expensive than silver. And again, we said copper is a very good conductor. Right? They also take note that gold is used as a conductor in microcircuits. Right? So we said earlier that conductors could be either good conductors or not so good conductors. Conductors conducting electrical current may do so well or not so well. So what do we call something that does not conduct so conduct a current so well. In other words, a current will not easily pass. It will have a lot of resistance. Such a material is called an insulator, a material that does not conduct current very well. It's called an insulator. So let's deal with the question associated with that theory. Which of the following is a good electrical insulator? And the answer given is glass. So glass is a good insulator, but it also means it is a poor conductor. Okay. So we have a few minutes again, and I would um, ask that persons who may have questions uh, send those questions via email, and we will attempt to, in the next session, answer any of those questions that persons may ask. 
So the few minutes remaining in the session, I would like to go through Ohm's law. So in the introduction, we did say a little bit of math is required. So here's where some of that math skills might come in. They make the point that Hams obey Ohm's law. But what is Ohm's law? We talked earlier about voltage, current, and resistance. We talked about other things as well, but current, voltage, resistance. Resistance, voltage, current. We talked about those as being properties that we look at in an electrical circuit. Ohm's law is the relationship between those three properties, voltage, current, and resistance. So there's a formula for that relationship. And this is where the maths come in. The formula for Ohm's law is that the voltage is equal to the current multiplied by the resistance. That is Ohm's law. Voltage is equal to the current multiplied by resistance. If you're writing the formula, you say E is equal to I multiplied by R, or E is equal to IR. That is Ohm's law as a formula. What it also means is that because it's a formula, if you know any two of those things, voltage, resistance, and current, if you know two of them, you could calculate the third one. That is the important part for us. So if I know voltage and I know current, I could calculate resistance. If I know the, the current and the resistance, I could calculate current. So let's get to the question in the question pool to do with the Ohm's law theory. And they simply ask, what formula is used to calculate voltage in a circuit? Well, we just said that Ohm's law is voltage is equal to current multiplied by resistance. So that will be the answer. Voltage equals current multiplied by the resistance. So of course, in your multiple choice, they will go and tell you all sorts of things like voltage is equal to current divided by resistance. They will give you all sorts of variations that are incorrect. But you know Ohm's law says that the voltage is equal to the current multiplied by the resistance. So that, once you learn that relationship, you will be good to go. Now we said that we're doing a bit of maths. And in the couple of minutes that we have left, let's see if we could wrap up this little section here on Ohm's law. So if you know voltage is equal to current multiplied by resistance, using algebra, we can move those values around in the equation and derive a relationship for the other. So if we know voltage equals something, we could move the terms around and end up with a current equals something. And we can also move it around again and say re resistance equals something. That manipulation that we do is called algebra. So via algebraic operations or using algebra, we move from the equation E is equal to IR. We move the terms around and solve for R. So if E is equal to I multiplied by R, we solve for R. So we say R is equal to E divided by I. Again, that is the algebraic operations. Uh, next session, I'll probably introduce you to a graphic that shows you once you learn that graphic, it will be very easy to derive any of the formulae. But just like we derive R is equal to E divided by I or R is equal to E over I, we can also solve for what I or current is. 
So let's go back to the original formula that we had, right? So we started with E voltage is equal to I, which is current, multiplied by R, which is resistance. We solve for R equal to E over I, or E divided by I, if we wanted to find out what I is equal to. Again, we manipulate the equation algebraically, and we end up with I is equal to E divided by R, or E over R. So really, all you really need to remember is this one formula, E is equal to I multiplied by R. And you can always, using algebra, solve for the other two versions of the formula. If you want to find out what R is, you move the terms around. If you want to find out what I is, you move the terms around and you end up with a new equation. With that, you can solve questions. So if someone says that you have a current of two amps and a resistance of one ohm, what is the voltage? Solve for E. It's simply two multiplied by one. Did I say two amps and one ohm? Yeah. So those are the types of calculations that you will do with Ohm's law. So folks, uh, we went through a bit of the theory today and also to show how the theory relates to the questions in the question pool. You are able to answer the questions in the question pool with some knowledge of the theory involved. So I would recommend that if it is in studying for the technician class, you can learn the theory, you will be able to answer the questions very easily. So that's why we are taking the approach of not simply going through the question pool, looking at the question and looking at the right answer and looking at the wrong answers and trying to memorize which is which. We are doing that with the theory. So throughout the rest of the course, we will be looking at the theory, not in great depth or detail. If we were to do that, this course will take three months, um, probably every day. So we are lightly touching the theory sufficiently so that hopefully the questions and the answers would be, you would be able to relate to them. But each of these concepts certainly can be more in depth. If you wish to go more in depth into the theory and have a deeper understanding on these concepts, earlier we mentioned that there are books that you can access online, as well as books you can purchase at Amazon that will go more in depth into the theory. Or you could use any one of the online resources that's available. But for the purpose of this course, we will be a little theory and look at the questions simply because this course is exam focused. So the time is now half past nine and we have come to the end of today's introductory session where we would have looked at the course, what's involved in amateur radio, what we are doing in respect of um, right, in respect of preparing for the exams. And I'm hoping that the format chosen would have been suitable to all of the participants on this course. I would appreciate your feedback on the approach. I would also appreciate your questions via email 
so that we can look at it. If I do not know the answer, I will do some research. And depending on the questions, we can aim at the start of each of our following sessions to answer any of the questions that have been asked by the participants. So I'm seeing a few comments in the chat box and thanks very much for the feedback. So now that we have come to the end of today's session, I would like to say firstly, thanks to everyone for your interest and participation in the course. Uh, the approach is via presentation style webinar. And I look forward to your feedback on the style of the course. So folks with that, let me wish you a very good evening. Um, when you get to uh, your rest, have a good night. Uh, tomorrow is a public holiday, I believe, um, arrival day. So uh, I'd like to wish everyone all the best. Um, enjoy the holiday. It's a Saturday. Uh, be safe, continue to um, take all the necessary precautions. Uh, via email, I will also ask if you can indicate whether Friday at 8.30 for one hour is a suitable day and time for you to attend the training. And similarly, via email, we will indicate when the next session is. As it is, it will be Fridays at 8.30 unless persons provide feedback to, su to suggest otherwise. So thank you again, everyone. Do have a good night.